Good evening, folks. I would like to call to order the Tuesday, June 26, 2018, uh, Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. Welcome. Uh, the first item on the agenda is typically the approval of our minutes from last meeting from May 22nd. Uh, my understanding is that uh, we still have a few, few blanks to fill in on those, so I would entertain a motion to table those minutes for further consideration at next at our next meeting. So moved. Second. All right. So moved by Mr. Mr. Looney. Seconded by Mr. Mosier. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor? Right. Very good. Motion carries unanimously. On to new business to hear the administrative appeal of Phil Keene and Brad Grossberg owners of the property at Two Garden Circle regarding the code enforcement officer's decision not to allow the expansion of a deck. And Mr. McDougall, our code enforcement officer, is here with us this evening. And, and Ben, perhaps you'd care to fill us in on, the, on this. Sure. Um, Mr. Keene came to me to speak with me about expanding a deck on the ocean side of his house at Two Garden Circle. Uh, I explained to him that the shoreline zoning was pretty limiting and the house is, uh, the deck would not meet the 75 foot setback to the ocean, so it didn't seem to me like it would be possible. He asked about his different avenues of relief with the zoning board, and I explained that there's the, the variance procedure and the administrative appeal procedure, and uh, he chose to file an administrative appeal to get a zoning interpretation on whether his proposal constitutes a structure from the zoning board. Thank you. Uh, we would then invite the applicants, Mr. Keene and Mr. Grossberg. Uh, please step forward to the, the podium. Good evening. Um, my name is Phil Keene. Uh, I appreciate your time and energy. And um, so, uh, Mr. McDougall Ben um, described it pretty well. He he. Um, he told me I couldn't do it, and so I came up with this idea of putting tables um, and arranging um, next to each other in a way to have uh, the, the use of the surface as a potential use, usefulness like a deck. But there, there, there are tables. So um, um, I mentioned it to, you know, I, I just really did it because I, I, I respect Ben. I, I didn't want him to come over and see me put these tables out that looked like a deck. And so I, I told him about this and he said that, that those were considered a structure. Um, and so I looked up definitions of what a structure is versus what furniture is. And if I were to put uh, the tables into the yard, it wouldn't be an issue. It would just be that when I put them together in a way that they look like a deck, they become something um, different. I think in my, my mind, the, um, the deck would be sitting on a pervious patio that's existing. It's been there for probably since the house was built. Um, so it wouldn't be encroaching upon any pervious or increase of any pervious uh, um, anything like that. It would just be really to uh, allow a better use of the, the yard. Um, I, I put in a pa in the packet, I have, uh, Brad has older parents. I have a, a mother that's um, on disability. I mean, she really can't, she has emphysema. She can't walk very far. And so um, in an attempt to make this house more usable, we thought that if we could somehow have it so that she could walk out of the living level, um, it would be much more uh, inviting for her. Also, um, we put in an elevator and a ramp to make it more accessible to my mother. I, I just, uh, I, I, I think in my mind, the, the real interpretation is whether this is a structure or is this is furniture. The idea would be that the tables could be moved into the garage when they're not being used and just put out whenever, um, the need arises to have an expanded uh, uh, deck area. Right now, the deck is fairly small. 
Um, it holds a table, a couple of chairs. Um, and uh, so, you know, if I wasn't within that setback, this wouldn't be an issue at all. I mean, but it's just that I'm in that setback. But, uh, but I also, I could, I mean, in, in my mind, I could put, you know, patio furniture in the yard or, or Adirondack chairs in the yard or tables in the yard. And it just, it's just really um, your interpretation is this um, a violation of the code or is this something that's allowed to be done? It, especially since it's movable, so it's, it's all temporary. Um, that was my biggest thought was that I was thinking, aha, when I came to Ben, I said, Ben, I came up with this brilliant idea. And he says, you can't do it. <laughs> so, um, but it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful view. And I'd love to just really in, have that piece to enjoy a little bit more with my family. So, um, I also, Brad is back there in the back, and, and my neighbor, um, Terry Garmy's back there as well, if, if, you, if they need to speak or have any concerns. Yep. Any questions? Question for the applicant. I have a question. <laughs> I don't know if it's a question for Ben or for you. I actually don't really understand the theory of your application. Um, the, the definition of a deck is an open platform. Ben has quoted the language which specifically includes temporary structures. It doesn't say <laughs> it matters what they're made of. I mean, cement blocks can be moved. I don't understand the theory of why it supposedly matters what you make of it. I, I just, um, it, it was really, a, a, it was the definition of a structure versus furniture. But the definition of deck is three words, an open platform. But also the, the in our definition in the paragraph Ben quoted specifies temporary. The six of us or eight of us are people. If we get together, we're a planning board and subject to rules and notice requirements and what we can say. Well, I, I mean, my, I, I just. Uh, you know, if I put chairs around it, they would be tables. I'm sorry? If I put chairs around it, it would be a table. It's essentially 30 inches off the ground. Yeah, but it's not. You put it together and it's a deck. I, I don't, I mean, that, that was the idea, that, that I would assemble in a way that would be usable as a deck, but not necessarily. But it's also, um, it's also furniture. I mean, m most Yeah, and we're also people, but when we're together, we're planning for it. Subject right. to rules. Right. And so is the deck. And whether you make it out of cement blocks or tables or bricks or two by fours, they're still two by fours, they're still cement blocks. You can make bookshelves out of cement blocks. I mean I don't I don't see where the out is. Well, I, I, I asked Ben, I said, would you go in front of the board and ask for this if it was your house? And he said, yes. He didn't, he didn't give me any encouragement no, that it would I, go through. I did not say I would bring this in front of the board. <laughs> sorry. I, may, maybe I wanted to hear that. I'm sorry. Okay. If, that's, if, if that's what I, I mean, I just, I, I just was hoping that the, this was the means to do something different in the sense that, um, you know, you just, in my mind, it was, it was, it was like the perfect um, way to sort of make that happen. Um, it already has a patio. It's just the patio is very steep. And I mean, I, I, I assume I put the pictures, you, you saw the photographs of the existing patio and the existing uh, deck. And uh, I, I think when they did, when the, when the, the folks that decided to have that 75 foot rule, it was, uh, the intention was to protect the shoreline. And um, 
in my thinking is that the the deck is the 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 patio is already there, so there's no more impervious being affected by this. You have to help if you have to help me around the words. The definition of deck in the town ordinance that we're obliged to enforce is an open platform. The definition in Ben's letter of this paragraph we all have in front of us include structures temporarily or permanently located such as decks. Decks is an open platform. Right. Temporary. It's a closed. I mean this is shoreland zoning strict. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. Any additional questions for the applicant? Is there a reason that you chose this route as opposed to seeking a variance? Did you have that discussion? No, I just, I, I thought that this was the route. I thought that this was the route. I, I just, I, I, I thought that this, I thought the, um, this was the, the, the way to go to it. Um, I, would, the, would a variance allow this to happen easier than, the, than you guys? I mean, I, I, I thought that this was, the group that decides this, I don't know. But this is the group that decides this, and, and you know, we certainly aren't here for the purpose of offering advisory opinions on an application that's not in front of us. However, just understand that a request for a variance is, is, is a difficult road to hoe, so to speak. Right. So, um, yeah, uh, would you please step to the podium? Sure. Thank you. Um, and, and you are Mr. I'm Brad Grosper, Bear. so I'm co-owner of the house on Garden Circle. If, if the same sections that Phil's talking about, whether we call them furniture or structures, were set out in the yard with chairs around them, and they weren't put together, they would be allowed. Am I correct in saying that? Yes. Yes. Okay. If you had furniture in the yard. Because yes. we're, we're, we're talking about semantics when we talk about the definition of a deck or temporary or permanent. And if they were in the yard with four chairs and you're having you know, dinner out there with the same number of sections, they would be okay. Because they're not, they're not creating any more uh, 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 problems with pervious situations or impervious situations. Um, so I, I'm trying to understand the difference between that and this, and the reason why, when you use the word deck, that it becomes problematic. But if you put them out there, or even if you spaced them up against the house and they're not a permanent structure, you had a foot in between them, um, and you had chairs on one side of them. So I, I, I'm just trying to understand the difference between the language and the intended reasoning for not being able to do that. If you can do it, you know, in the yard, but not just in a certain space or whether they're right up next to each other. Our job is to interpret existing ordinance. And in the context then of this appeal, we're asked to interpret the meaning of the term structure. As that term is very, quite generally defined, I shouldn't say generally, uh, is, is defined within the ordinance. And uh, as Mr. Craver has pointed out, a deck, an open platform, is clearly intended to be included within that definition. And I think that's the concern that we have. Um, of course, the purpose here is, is not necessarily to, to have a, a discussion about this, but I do want to give other board members an opportunity to ask any further questions of the applicants. Uh, just a couple of questions. On the deck, I'm looking at the application that you have. There's a, the, the patio, and then there's, it looks like the pressure treated deck. Did, do you understand how that was, can you explain how that was built? That's, that's an existing um, structure that was re resurfaced. Right, so there was a deck there that was essentially replaced, repaired, right? Yes. Yes. And on the patio, did, have you considered raising that patio? 
with dirt and, and just raise that up another foot, two feet, and Is put the stuff. I'm not here to provide advice to you. I'm just saying, have you considered that as an option? Our goal, our goal is to have an open, non-step surface between inside and outside, whether it's dirt or... Okay, you, have, you would have issues with the, the basement lights right. um, and the overhang, but the point that we're talking about is, if you have a square piece of wood in the yard, it's not a deck. You may, you know, it's pieces of lumber on the grass. When it's attached to the house, it becomes part of the structure, okay? Where your property is located, there are certain further rules that have to apply. And this is the tricky part. Yes, theoretically, you could put furniture or, or stack of wood, stack of bricks, and, and do that. But then the issue is the purpose upon which that you're using it for. So it, essentially, um, attaching the, a new deck over the top of the patio becomes part of the structure. That's not allowed at this location, uh, and generally speaking. So that's why I was asking whether you considered essentially raising up the, the patio, uh, in theory, you'd have a stone wall on one side, uh, and that would have it pretty much flush with the deck. I would do that. Well, that would create a problem. Now, the, the issue here is that, you know, before, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled with the pieces of furniture point because one is you have an example of what a deck looks like. And you're assembling pieces of material to make it, to use it as a deck. And that raises an issue of safety and uh, building, um, <coughs> building application. Good going, good going. Thank you. Uh, and that's where certain minimum requirements are necessary. And that's why we're struggling with, you know, just piecing furniture together is the functional equivalent of a deck. And if you attach it, you know, attach it to the, the other deck or to the structure, then it is part of the new structure that can't be allowed here. So that's why I'm just trying to think about how you can get what you want, but not the furniture route. And I'm, I'm struggling with, um, uh, I, I see your point where you just, just buy, a, a, move the tables and chairs away and you put the, the, the pieces of deck, um, the tables there, sure, you, it's, you could use it, theoretically. Um, but not, I don't, I'm, I'm troubled here with how it's, it's uh, in the application. So that was my only query, is whether you considered having a, a dirt patio and raising that. Um, I, would, I would do that, is that something that this board? Uh, uh, that's probably if, um, a further consideration to Ben, the code enforcement officer, to go that route. Um, I'm just, um, yeah, so I, I cannot uh, um, give you uh, advice on that particular point. That would be a, a further offline conversation that you would have with, with Ben at some other time as to, what, as to whether that's advisable, whether that's allowed under the ordinance, et cetera. Additional questions for the applicants? Very good. Hearing none, thank you both. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, any other uh, members of the public wish to comment on the pending application? Ben, did we receive any email, written feedback, phone calls? I, I did receive one email from someone in the neighborhood uh, stating that they support my decision. Please, please step to the podium, Terry. Thank you. I'm Terry Garmy, and I'm a neighbor, and I support their use. It seems to me that I, I rarely go someplace I don't have an opinion, so this is an uninvited opinion. Forgive it. But temporary and movable might be two separate things. Temporary. Um, is something in my mind that's not designed to endure as long as the structure to which it's contiguous. But movable is something completely different. And, um, and it seems to me an instinct, and all due respect for the capillary, to, to somehow um, make tables that can be assembled a foot apart um, 
inappropriate if they're put together. But that's just my thought. The spirit of the the spirit of the land use zoning ordinance, I wouldn't think would be offended um, by this. It's not going to diminish the shoreland. It's not going to interfere with anybody else's use, and it has no environmental impact. Beyond that, I'm not sure the ordinance has any teeth. So, in all due respect, that's my two cents. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> any further public comment? Hearing none, we will uh, close the public comment uh, <coughs> section of the meeting for this particular agenda item and uh, enter into board discussion. Yes. I have a, a question for Ben. Is it within the purview of this board to consider an application for a real deck of the type that they originally proposed to you, or is that not within our purview? Uh, I, <clears throat> I think the only thing that's within your purview is, is the application that was submitted. Not, to, not this evening. Could the applicant submit an application to this board for the expansion of the existing deck in a, in a non-conform, you know, it's a non-conformity because the entire house is within the shoreland setback. Would the board have the jurisdiction to consider an application for the deck that they originally proposed to you? It would, uh, I, I think the other route would be a variance. As opposed to a, an, an expansion of a nonconformity? Well, if, if they could demonstrate that they could meet the requirements of that section, yes, but I'm not sure that they can. Is, is there a, a code provision that would absolutely prohibit the installation of a deck at the rear of this dwelling? Well, part of that section says that no part of the structure can be closer to the ocean than existing. Mm -hmm. and, and what what town body has authority to vary from that restriction? Well, that, that's what kicks you to a variance. A variance. You, you go from a non-conforming expansion that we've heard if someone's within 75 feet and they want to expand their structure but they're not getting closer to the ocean. So for a variance they would have to show a hardship Correct. as opposed to simply um, complying with the provisions for expansion of a non-conformity. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Further board discussion? I'll, I'll just throw my two cents in. I, I commend the creativity um, of the application. I, I have aging parents myself, and um, it's actually given me an interesting idea. But uh, it, it's, you know, I go back to, I mean, the definition I think in, in my mind is pretty clear that uh, this is a structure, it is a temporary structure. It's not really what it's made of or you know, what it hypothetically could be used for, it's what its use is intended to be. Um, I was thinking, you know, you put those same 10 tables in the yard, if suddenly you decided, hey, you're gonna have a table dancing party, those then become 10 decks under this definition. Um, it technically wouldn't be allowed. It's a little bit of a probably ridiculous comparison, but um, in my mind, the language is pretty clear, and even though I, I, I definitely sympathize and empathize with what you're trying to do, I, 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 I can't find a reason here to uh, overturn Ben's decision. And in, in the interest of, of brevity and not restating what Mr. Juice just said, I, I agree. I, I res completely respect your creativity. Um, something interesting to think about, but when we look at the definitions of structure and deck, it just simply doesn't comply with the ordinance. And any, you know, the, I think the approach is, well, there's 10 pieces of furniture that can be put together, but the same argument would be, there's a pile of lumber there with some screw holes in it, and why don't we just assemble that pile of lumber into a deck temporarily, and then we'll take it apart and make it a pile of lumber again. And just a different way to do that, and it's still a deck when it's done, it's a structure. Sounds like we may have the 
basis for a motion here. Uh, and so I'll ask if I hear a motion to uh, affirm the code enforcement officer's decision not to allow the expansion of a deck of Phil Keen and Brad Grosberg, owners of the property at Two Garden Circle. Is there such a motion? Uh, I'll move that. So Mr. moved. So moved by Mr. Looney. Second. I have a second. Discussion on the motion. The, the reason that I, I made that motion is that I agree that the uh, code enforcement officer was proper in his interpretation of the code and that the proper vehicle for the applicant to request relief from the town is a variance application and not an appeal of the uh, code enforcement officer's interpretation. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion. Give a second. Oh, yes. Oh, we have a second. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> All in favor of the motion. Okay. That is unanimous. The motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming Thank in. You. Thank you for the presentation. Let's move on to agenda item uh, D2 to hear the administrative appeal of 1226 Shore Road LLC, represented by Natalie Burns, Esquire, Jensen Baird, Gardner, and Henry. Hello, Natalie. Uh, regarding the code enforcement officer's denial of uh, building permit application for 1226 Shore Road, I will be recusing myself from consideration on this matter, and uh, so Mr. Mosher will step in as chair. Thanks, Mr. Valencourt. Would you like to come on? Thanks. Good evening, board members. As stated by the chair, who's now leaving us, my name is Natalie Burns from Jensen Baird Gardner and Henry, and I'm here tonight representing 1226 Shore Road, LLC. We are here appealing a decision of the code enforcement officer to deny a building permit um, for the redevelopment project that is proposed at that location. Uh, it received its site plan approval on October 10th, 9, uh, 2017. It's to be a mixed use development. And as you know from probably driving past that property on a continual basis, as all of us in Cape Elizabeth do, uh, it consists of two buildings. Um, the front building is going to be referred to tonight as building one, and the rear building is going to be referred to as building two. Um, the conditions of, there were conditions of approval imposed by the planning board. Um, do you all have a copy of the um, submission materials that we did? Great, because I'm going to refer to those. Um, if you want to take a look at the conditions of approval at this point, uh, those are in Exhibit 2 on pages 2 and 3. On January 23rd, 2018, the town planner sent a letter to uh, 1226 Shore Road LLC, the property owner. Uh, this is found in Exhibit 3, and certainly you can read that for yourself, but just a summary of it is that um, the plans that have been submitted were not consistent with the planning board approval, uh, that revised plans needed to be submitted showing uh, the full layout of building two uh, and parking calculations needed to be provided as required by the planning board. Uh, the letter also states that there's a full kitchen in building two, a bathroom and living space, and it expressed a concern that in fact building two was a dwelling unit and also that there was a dwelling unit in the basement of building one. Um, another concern raised was that the building was larger than approved in a prior site plan. Um, it's important to note here that uh, at the time that both the front building and the back building were built, my, my client was not the owner of those properties and was not responsible for the size of those buildings. Um, and they have been in existence for, uh, the building two has been in existence since at least 2004. 
So in response to this letter, uh, the property owner did submit additional plans showing the full layout of building two, uh, providing the measurements um, being done as set forth in the town planner's letter, also required by the zoning ordinance, and also setting forth the parking calculation. Um, it also, it, the parking calculation showed that uh, the requirements of the zoning ordinance for both buildings was met. Um, and the plans also show the use of building two as office and storage, which was another requirement, condition three of the planning board approval. Uh, these plans were submitted on March 2nd, 2018, um, and they are in your packet as well. Uh, on May 14th, 2018, the property owner submitted a building permit application. Um, to construct the 15,000 square feet of mixed use and commercial retail um, on the first floor in apartments and condos on the second floor of building one. On May 25th, the code enforcement officer denied the permit and that denial letter is in exhibit one. The basis of the denial was the failure to comply with the planning board's conditions of approval as discussed in the town planner's January 23rd, 2018 letter. We are here tonight because it's our position that the plans that were submitted and that are included in, in the exhibits comply with the specific conditions of approval um, imposed by the planning board. Specifically, conditions two, three, and four are all addressed in the plan submitted. They show the parking requirements, the use of the basement of building one and that it's not residential, and floor plans for both floors of building two. They also show that the use of building two is office and related storage, not residential. The property owner is not seeking at this time, does not have a residential use in building two or building one at this time, and is not seeking to have a residential use in either of those buildings. Um, finally, the planning board did not include a limitation on the size of the building. Uh, it's our position that the planning board knew what the size of the building was. It might not have had specific measurements for it, but it was asked to approve a reuse of an existing building. So any argument that that building isn't the size that was originally approved is not really an issue. It was addressed during the site plan approval and the planning board clearly had some concerns about whether it had accurate measurements because it required the applicant to go back redo measurements, submit floor plans, and confirm that the parking requirement for the overall development was met. Um, issues concerning whether there's a permitted use or an unpermitted use in the building um, refers to things that happened before my client owned the building. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what's required to constitute a dwelling unit. Certainly there isn't one there now. Um, so, the three things that are relied upon in the letter as supporting the conclusion that there's a dwelling unit in building two is that there is a kitchen. That kitchen predates my client's ownership. There is a bathroom. The bathroom predates my client's ownership. And there is a statement that there is living area. Now, this isn't a term that is defined in the ordinance, but the term dwelling unit is defined in the ordinance. And it states in the first sentence that it's a room or group of rooms designed and equipped exclusively for use as permanent, seasonal, or temporary living quarters for only one family at a time and containing cooking, sleeping, and toilet facilities. The existence of a kitchen and a bathroom by itself does <coughs> not create a dwelling unit. Uh, there must also be sleeping facilities, and it must be designed and equipped solely for use as a residential dwelling unit. Here, there's no sleeping facilities. It's not designed and equipped exclusively as living facilities. In fact, it's not used at all for living facilities. Uh, if you look at the definition of a banking professional or business office, in the uh, town code, this is the use category that this building falls into, it does not prohibit kitchens and bathrooms in an office. 
In fact, there are other uses. There are probably many offices in town that do have kitchens and bathrooms, and there are other non-residential uses that, that have full kitchens and bathrooms. Daycare centers, churches may have them both, schools almost certainly have them both. I believe the, the community center has a full kitchen and certainly has full bathroom facilities in it. Related to the claim of uh, residential use, the town's planner, the town planner's January 23rd discusses alleged violations of the zoning ordinance. Um, as stated before, if those violations occurred, they occurred prior to my client's ownership of the property, and they don't exist at this time. There are no dwelling units in either building one or building two. Um, if my client gets the building, when my client gets the building permit, there will be newly constructed dwelling units in building one, not one in building two, and not one in the basement of building one. So the site plan approval establishes the uses that are allowed in this development, um, and the owner will continue to comply with that approval. It's not in violation of it at this time and does not seek to change those approved uses. Furthermore, if there were a violation, there's nothing in the ordinance that authorizes the town staff to turn down a building permit because there's a zoning violation. That's to be dealt with under section 19-3-6 of the ordinance, which requires the issuance of a notice of violation and then further action based upon that. It does not authorize the withholding of a permit. Um, with me tonight, I have Steve Bushy um, of Sebago, I'm sorry, not Sebago, of Stantec, sorry Steve, um, who is the engineer who worked on this project. If you have any specific questions about plans, uh, he can help you with those, and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that the board may have for me. Thank you. Is there any other questions? We'll also can address Ben too. I have a question. Um, prior to the purchase of this property by your client, was a compliance letter requested from the town of Cape Elizabeth regarding um, its compliance with current zoning re regulations? I, I, sorry, I can't answer that question. I don't know, and my client is not here right now, so he can't answer it. Uh, ben, would you have been the official that would have been asked to provide such a letter? Uh, typically, that would be asked of me. I, I, I did not get such a request. I, I can confirm that there's no notice of violation in the file. So if someone had come in and looked at the file, they would not have seen a notice of violation. I've got a few questions, and, and probably more will be generated by this, but I, if you could help me out with the timing here a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm, I'm really just going from January to now. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the site plan approval was, well, I guess it's really, the site plan approval was received with conditions last October. Right. And plans were submitted. The town planner came back in her letter and said, these haven't met for X, Y, and Z. Um, that's right, and I would agree that they didn't meet X. They did not fully meet X, Y, and Z. They okay, needed so, to be resubmitted. So they, they needed to be resubmitted, and then over the course of the next couple of months, new plans were developed and prepared in March, and then was the next, next action thereafter to apply for a building permit? Was there no further um, submission of plans to the town planner? There doesn't appear to be any correspondence in the package from the town planner suggesting that conditions had been or had not been met. I'm not aware of any further communications from the town planner on this, but certainly if the code enforcement officer is aware of any, he can, he can correct me on that. I mean, I'm just, I, I feel like there's a timing gap here where new information was submitted or prepared. I'm not sure if it was submitted or to whom it was submitted, but there's, you know, uh, I read, you know, the code enforcement officer's letter, hey, these were conditions. I haven't seen evidence that those conditions have been cleared by the town planner. Uh, and that's the basis, effectively the basis for the denial. Uh, I can confirm the that the revised plans were submitted on March 2nd. And those were the plans that are shown in the exhibits that you have. I believe that's exhibit four. And when you say submitted, they were submitted to? Uh, I believe they were submitted to the town planner. Okay. 
but there was no further correspondence from from the town planner as far as you know ben are you, are you aware of any further correspondence i'm not okay and i'm probably going to have some more questions I, I feel like i came in the 10th inning of the nine inning game in this and this has been ongoing for a, a little me, while um if i want to follow up on your questions, if you're finished. I, I'm, I'm finished for now. <laughs> Am I cutting you off? Go ahead. Um, I'm a little C here, procedure-wise, and I'm not sure if this is a question for you or Ben, but what is the provision of a conditional approval? I mean, where is that in the statute for a planning board to issue a conditional approval, number one, and number two, where is where does it say that the planner decides if those conditions have been met? Who decides? What? <laughs> Where is it? This, this planning board approval lists conditions, which means apparently it's been issued, but it hasn't been issued. And so where does it say how that works? I, I didn't find it in the ordinance. Number one, and again, I'm repeating myself, but number two, so when there are conditions, I mean, if it said you have to put a 30-foot flagpole in, um, does the planning officer go over there and say, yeah, they put on a flagpole, or does it have to come to the planning board? Who decides? I mean, we're, we have a whole discretionary issue over what happened after the planning board meeting and what information was available and who discussed it, and I don't, I don't really see any guidance because this leads directly to how does it wind up with us? Yeah. I mean, your, your denial is, well, the planning officer says the conditions weren't met. Well, who says that's, she's authorized to do that, and who says they're authorized to have a conditional approval in the first place? Where is that coming from? Right, and on the code enforcement side, uh, the condition was these have to be met, and then there's a letter from the planner saying they weren't met, so of course Ben has to deny it because the town said they weren't met. Uh, I would well, I, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> What the documentation says, I don't see where in the ordinance it provides for that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask step. my question a little more succinctly, which is why are we here exactly, as opposed to yeah. in front of the planning board, but I didn't want to be. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I'm asking. Am I not being clear at all? I understand what you're asking. I, I don't have all the answers to your questions. I'm not intimately familiar with planning board okay. laws. Well, so, so again, so we're. we're if I could answer, um, first of all, it's not unusual for planning boards to impose conditions of approval. And certainly, we didn't challenge those conditions of approval. Um, when some plans were submitted, they were found not to be acceptable. And so new plans were submitted. And then, as best I can tell, there was no response to that. So at that point, my client applied for a building permit. And of course, as the board knows, the denial of a building permit does come before you. So as, oh. as far as we're concerned, this board gets to look at whether the submissions met the requirements of the conditions. And the okay, conditions do say, they say what they say. <laughs> right, they say what they say. But our denial is based on, I mean, Ben's, Ben's denial. letter denial. Right, Ben's, correct, thank you very much. Uh, Ben's letter is based on the planner saying the conditions haven't been met. Oh, and of now, course, you're saying we should brush that aside. Well, that letter predates the submission of the additional plans because the letter is from January and the plans, additional plans were submitted in March. And so there's no response after March until my client applies for a building permit and then is told, no, you can't have a building permit because of the January letter, which my client had responded to. Ah. So my client didn't just say, well, I don't care what you said in the January letter. My client went out and got the work done, hired the architect, had the engineer do the work that was necessary, and submitted the plans. And I think probably the most important one of those plans is the parking plan, because obviously the planning board wanted to be clear um, that the parking requirements under the zoning ordinance were met, and, and that is true. Now, from the staff's perspective, there's also this issue of a residential use, but you can't tell a property owner to go back to the planning board and seek an amendment for something that, that the property owner isn't seeking. Okay. Um, so, 
Um, it's confusing, I agree. Uh, if, if I could just ask maybe one clarification, clarification question to Ben. Was your denial based I mean, it says it's based on, on the letter from the town planner. Was there any other information that went into your denial? Did you, uh, were you looking at any of these conditions? I, I did not look at the conditions okay. and review compliance with the conditions. I just wanted to clarify that as we and, and discuss this. I paid to clarify yours. As I just understood, she submitted, they submitted those after her letter. Did, did you look at the conditions? before her letter and after, or neither before nor after? Neither. Okay. The, as, as she stated, uh, planning boards often put conditions on approvals. Actually, every approval I've seen has conditions, and it is the planner's jurisdiction. I can't point you to the specific language, but the planner gives me the green light to issue the building okay. permit mm -hmm. based on the conditions. Okay. And I didn't get it on this one. You didn't get it from this one. Now, did you know that she had received additional conditions since the letter that she denied them? Yes. And that I, she had received additional information since she had denied them, if I have understood correctly the sequence. I, I was aware that there was some additional back and forth after her okay. letter. I don't know the details of it. So she didn't give you any change of her position based on the additional material? Correct. She, she continued to say that they have not met the conditions of the I approval. see. So you talked to her about it and she said, no, it's not good enough yet. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. And that was after. So it's not just based so on okay. the letter. It's based on your conversations with her subsequent to the letter, including her review of the additional materials. Well, I, I guess you could say both. I mean, I, you know, I asked her, do you still, you know, stand by your letter that the conditions okay. haven't been met? And her response was, yes, the letter is, I still stand by that, that the conditions haven't been met. Uh, I've got a <clears throat> question here. There appears to be something missing, maybe a communication breakdown. Does anyone understand, has anyone had a conversation with the planner since those plans were submitted and understand why she still feels that they, they the conditions aren't, haven't been met? Uh, I tried to have a conversation with the town planner and I was told that I had to talk to the town attorney. So I did talk to the town attorney and he mentioned to me that he didn't know very much about it. Um, but I know one thing he did say was, well, the building is larger than what was approved. And then I pointed out, well, the building is an existing building, so my client didn't build something larger. It, if it's larger than what was initially approved, you know, that's, that's just an enforcement thing that didn't happen a few years ago when it got built uh, or expanded. I'm not really quite sure of the full history of that building. Um, so we have not been able to get an answer because if there were some other plan we could submit, um, it would have been submitted. We wouldn't be here before this board if we had been able to get a satisfactory answer as to why the building permit was, and I shouldn't say why the building permit was denied. Uh, the code enforcement officer gave a denial letter and said exactly why. He said it was based upon the town planner's January letter. Um, we can't ask more than that of him, but that is the basis of the denial. It's not something that happened afterwards. Nothing that happened afterwards is referred to in that letter, and that's what we have to go by. That's what we have to appeal to this board is what's in the denial letter. And so our, our submission to you is that we've submitted the plans that the planning board asked for. There's a parking calculation. There's confirmation that building two is not in residential use. There's confirmation that the basement of building one is not in residential use. We don't know what else we can do to get a building permit. And I think the board can appreciate that there are time limits here. Because this was an October approval, my client has one year to start construction. We're already in June, and we still don't know why we don't have a building permit. So it, there really is some urgency to this, and, and we, we really would um, ask the board to take a look at this and agree with us that we have submitted what needs to be submitted and order the issuance of the building permit. 
I have some questions, unless you want to jump in. Can, can I just follow up with a few things? So the, approximately how much larger is building one than 800 square feet? Uh, well, it's not 800 square feet. And I think if you look at exhibit four, there are measurements in that as to how large it is. And I, I would note something that, um, first of all, the architect, who unfortunately could not be with us tonight because she was at another meeting, told us that they did not do measurements for that building because it's an existing building and no changes were proposed to it. And the second thing that I think the board is well aware of is that Cape Elizabeth has a different measurement for, in, for space than other towns do. You measure from the exterior walls, and in other towns you usually measure uh, from the interior walls and you exclude certain kinds of spaces. That's not true in Cape Elizabeth. So those numbers look larger than the architect would have thought they would be with mm -hmm. the original submission. The building isn't any larger than it was, but that explains why there is a discrepancy in those numbers. But it is confirmed in Exhibit 4 as to what the actual measurement is, and it's done correctly under the town's ordinance. And <laughs> is, the, is the, the issue with the discrepancy, as you understand it, and as the planning board showed concern, has to do with the parking ratios and number of parking spaces required? Only? Well, I should be clear that I was not involved in the planning board process, but certainly there's a concern expressed in the planning board conditions of approval that you have to meet the parking requirements, and because of the mixed-use nature of the development, that clearly would have been an important issue for them. And um, I will say it is my best guess that that's why they wanted those measurements, to make sure that the parking calculation could be met for each of the proposed buildings and uses. And when, when, that was, when that calculation was revised in March, I think it was, um, it, did the required number of parking spaces change? And were there parking spaces added to the design? I, I cannot answer the question of how many parking spaces were shown in the original plan, but the required number is five, and there is adequate parking on the site for that. In fact, my client was telling me that the planning board uh, wished that there would be less pavement and not more pavement, but the, um, the plan as resubmitted does meet the parking requirements for both buildings. Hi. I have another question. I think it's somehow for you and Ben. In the, in the I think it's in your letter to uh, the planner, and you brought it up also. You mentioned that there is a whole sink and bathroom. There's a whole sort of residential uh, infrastructure built into the apartment, and that the new owner would have to address that. Yes, uh, there and was. There was a, the, in building, uh, I believe we're calling it building two, the rear Correct. building, uh, the prior owner uh, illegally installed a kitchen in that building without permits or approvals. Okay, so what is the, you, you mentioned that the proper redress for this is whatever it is, but in any case, would that, did that figure into your, I mean, that, that, that was not addressed by her in her letter, but you mentioned that you brought it up. I mean, is that an issue in the... I, I didn't bring it up. Okay. And if my client needs to get plumbing or electrical permits that were not gotten uh, by the prior owner, my client is more than willing to do that. Oh, no, correct. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Yeah, the planner brought it up. So that's, in a sense, that's not your issue anymore, or that's not an issue for you? I mean, it's, it's something that needs to be resolved because it's something that happened that requires permits that, and there weren't <coughs> permits. But that's not, that's, that's not my issue in denying the building permit. Okay. Ms. Burns, have you, or has your client um, considered returning to the planning board as the planner has suggested? My client does not want to return to the planning board because of the time that will be lost going to the planning board. And furthermore, my client isn't asking for any changes from what was approved by the planning board. The planning board uh, clearly recognized in the conditions of approval that the measurements needed to be redone, and they were redone. 
Um, the planning board did not address the kitchen and the bathroom issue, um, but I think the town has been aware that these at least some of these facilities are here. We saw a 2013 letter from the code enforcement officer to the prior owner saying, hey, it looks like you're putting a stove in there. If you're putting a stove in there, that's a problem. You need permits for that. I'm not sure it's allowed. And there's nothing else in the file about it after that. And we assume then that the stove has been there since 2013. We don't know when the rest of the things went in. But they are there. And it's a significant cost to remove a kitchen or a bathroom. And there's nothing in the ordinance that says that a, an office can't have a kitchen and a bathroom. I can tell you my office has a full kitchen, it has a full bathroom, and it has wood floors in it. But it's not a living space. And, and this also is not a living space. It's not used for that purpose. There's no sleeping quarters in this. And there won't be any sleeping quarters in it. If there are, that will become an enforcement issue. So, so the, the area that, so we have some documentation here of correspondence between Ben and the planner about whether or not there is a dwelling unit. Um, but you're saying it, if, it doesn't matter because the proposed use is, is not residential for that space anyways, it's office space. So and the current if it was, yeah. wasn't was conforming right. previously, it doesn't matter going space. forward right. because it's proposed office space and the office happens to have a kitchen in the bathroom and, and maybe they, they weren't, uh, maybe they didn't receive the correct approvals at the time, but they're there. That's right. Okay, thank you. I, I hope this will be quick. Um, okay. So we're just going to walk through a couple of the exhibits they have as part of the application. So in the October 20th, 2017 letter from the planning board to Stantec, which would be the architect, is that correct? That would be the engineer. Engineer. Um, your client would receive a copy of that, uh, that letter. Um, and there were, you mentioned earlier that there was no dispute from your client as to this letter upon receipt. There is no dispute that the conditions of approval needed to be met. That's correct. Right. And, and the reference to the conditions is paragraph 9 on page 3. Uh, no issuance of a, essentially the summary catch-all condition. Uh, that there be no issue of a building permit nor alteration of the site until the above conditions have been satisfied and a performance guarantee has been provided to the town. You, you agree. So it has, um, obviously, no building permit has been um, uh, issued. Uh, has there been a performance guarantee provided to the town? I cannot answer that question, but if, uh, if that's the only thing that's standing between the um, issuance of the building permit and my client, my client will get the performance guarantee in. But it wasn't denied. I'm sorry to interrupt. It wasn't denied on the basis that a performance guarantee hadn't been provided. Right. So at, at the end of that letter, uh, okay. So that takes us from October into the new year, and then there's a letter from the town planner to um, Stantec again, uh, January 23rd, 2018. And there's, this is where there's um, uh, issues with the application. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And so then there's a discussion at the back, at the last paragraph, saying if, there's, if you want to um, uh, have it before the workshop scheduled for February 6th, um, please notify um, uh, the town planner on January 30th. I, I take it an opportunity was there, but it wasn't. Nothing happened on that the February It did 6th. not happen because my client wasn't seeking any changes to the planning board approval. Yeah. Um, and, and, okay, so then that is a procedural structure there. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions, see where you can uh, help me with uh, finding here in the code or otherwise. Uh, the first is why is this application right before the board? So help us understand the jurisdiction of the board to say or to override that the town planner should or must uh, have provided a, a release, approval, whatever you wish to call it. So where is that? Where did the, the board, are, as, a, as a board, where do we have the power for that? Uh, 
Um, well, first of all, I'm going to start with 19-3-2, uh, subsection C, which requires a building permit. Page I'm sorry, I, it's page 34. Thank you. At least on the online version, which I hope is the same as your version. Yes. And so a determination under that is a decision of the code enforcement officer, which is appealable to you under, I believe, section 19 4 5-2-A, yes, as an administrative appeal. And that is on page 59 of the ordinance. Okay, so we have identified our two sections in the code that deals with an act or a decision by the code enforcement officer. I think there's no dispute there. But what is the, we are at a loss for a provision that deals with requiring the town planner to act or not act. And whether the, 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 the board here can, and essentially override a non-action by the town planner? Well, I would remind you that the action that was requested by my client was the issuance of the building permit. And that is within the purview of the code enforcement officer. And so as the code enforcement officer explained, he coordinates with the town planner, but ultimately it is his decision as to whether to issue a building permit. We have a chicken and the egg problem. And that in the sense that we have a condition precedent that has not been satisfied. The parties may disagree as to whether that's true or not. But the point is that there's a set of conditions that the, code, that the town planner has maintained through um, correspondence and via the code enforcement officer that have not been satisfied. So we, we are tracing back to a, a thread to the original set of conditions. And so my, my and that gets to the question is whether this application is ripe and whether it should be before us. I mean. I'm not sure how it cannot be ripe when there was an application for a building permit denied. That's, that's as ripe as it can get. Matt, can, go ahead. Can I try to help clarify? Because I think I, I'm struggling with the exact same thing. And I, I agree. I mean, there is an action. There's an administrative appeal before us. And, and that part is ripe. But I, I guess I'm struggling with. There are nine conditions precedent that were given by the planning board, and those, those were laid out. And at least one of them, I think we all agree, hasn't been addressed at all, and that's the performance guarantee, although I, I take you at your word that that could come tomorrow if, if it needed to. Well, we don't know that it hasn't been addressed. Well, we don't know it, okay, we don't know it hasn't been addressed, but it hasn't been addressed at all in this application, as far as I can tell. Well, because My, it wasn't a basis of denial. It, it can only address well, what was the basis of The basis of, denial. of the denial was that the conditions precedent hadn't been met, and it's one of the conditions precedent. Or the basis of the denial was the town planners. But be that as it may, I understand you not going before the planning board because there was no change to it, but wouldn't it be appropriate to go before the planning board as a matter of you've, is, you've given us these conditions, we've satisfied the conditions, vote to say that we've satisfied the conditions. I, I don't think we're allowed to do that. I think we have to work through the town planner who will not meet with us to discuss why what we've submitted is not satisfactory. So here we are. Well, let, uh, let me pick up on what, just exactly what you said, because I was kind of right where you are. I mean, we're in the middle here between the planning board and the planner, it seems to me, as to what, whether these conditions have been met. And there were these two meetings, and your guy said, well, I've already met the conditions. I'm not going to those meetings. OK, I'm going to go to us and appeal it to Ben, who has written a letter, but hasn't really looked at the subsequent information. And now we're supposed to decide, I think it says de novo, based on the facts that the planning board hasn't seen. Our Two, the two professionals involved haven't really approved. I mean, I'm very uncomfortable with that situation. And I don't quite understand, if I'm making sense, and I don't understand, I guess, 
I mean, what I, I'm not, this isn't a motion, but what I find myself wanting to do is table this until your client goes back and talks, either goes to one of these working sessions and say, we've met all the conditions, right? No, we would have to go through a full planning board process to go back to the planning board, which could take two months, which will get us thought, close to October. I, you know, I thought my, they were working sessions. You, you don't go back to the planning board if you're meeting the conditions of approval, and we're not being told how we're not meeting the conditions of approval. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be impatient, but this is exactly the problem that we've had for months, is that we cannot get an answer as to how the plans don't meet the requirement, and what else is unsatisfactory besides an allegation that there's a use existing there that is not existing there, and therefore we have to go back to the planning board to amend the plan when we want to build what was approved by the planning board in the first instance. So why would we go back to the planning board to amend the plan? I don't think anybody's suggesting you amend the plan. I think oh, it's just, it's that's exactly what the town planner said in the January letter. You have to go back to the planning board and amend the plan. That's yes, and there were subsequent actions taken to address the comments. And in terms of the March plan, there's been no correspondence since then. I I, I continue to struggle. I mean, you know, we're all residents of the town. We can come to the planning board at any one of the public meetings and comment. We can put something on the agenda if, if we want. Um, you know, your 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 client is a, a landowner. Uh, with status in the town. There's no reason you couldn't come before the planning board and seek that clarification. And if the planning board's not willing to give that clarification, that's an issue for them to address. And then it may become an issue for the code enforcement officer to address in deciding whether or not you've met the conditions for a building permit. But I don't see that having taken place here. And I, I, I fully appreciate there's a, a timing aspect of, of that involved but uh, I mean it's it's been six months <laughs> it's a build on it's it's build on that there's it's the January been since March yeah. and we have not had a response as to why the resubmission was not acceptable except that we were referred back to the January letter which was written prior to the resubmission and so it, it it doesn't ever end for my client. My client never gets an answer from the town as to what is unsatisfactory, other than to be told to go back to the planning board to amend an approval that my client doesn't want to amend. That's not a satisfactory result. We do have an appeal pending before this board of a denial of a building permit, and my client is entitled to have this board act upon that application. Okay. Mr. Question for the code enforcement okay. officer. Go ahead. Um, uh, ben, we have in our backup here um, uh, an email between you and the town planner where she asked you to inspect the property and to render your opinion regarding the uh, dwelling unit in building two. And in it, you state that it meets the definition of a dwelling unit and that the kitchen was installed without required permits or inspections. So to me, that means it's an active violation on the property. Is that correct? Yes. So rather than resolve the active violation on the property, the applicant is arguing that it is not a violation because they don't intend to use it as a dwelling unit? They are not using it as a dwelling unit. Well, it can't it, be a dwelling unit if you're not using it as one. Just because it has a kitchen and a bathroom doesn't make it a dwelling unit. With all due respect to the code enforcement officer, now, that's not the definition in the ordinance. Your, your applicant is requesting a building permit for his new development. And he wants to keep building two as it is with an illegal dwelling unit in it. Is that correct? No, he does not want a dwelling unit in building two. He wants an office that has a kitchen and a bathroom in it. Well, no one will be living there. It, it, ha it was constructed without permits, so it's, it's in violation. And I asked you if, during due diligence on the property, you or your client requested a letter from the town as to whether or not the property was in compliance with zoning codes. Now, I'm familiar with this property, and 
That building was used as a dwelling unit by the person who previously owned it. Not all the time, but on occasion it was. So for you to say that it's not a dwelling unit, when I know for a fact it was used as a dwelling unit, is not credible. It's not used as a dwelling unit now. It has not been used as a dwelling unit during my client's ownership of the property. And to say that no one will ever buy a property when there may be a violation in it that can be resolved by going through site plan and bringing the property into conformance with the ordinance, you're never going to get properties back into compliance if you do that. It's just going to sit there as a vacant property with, with someone saying, well, there's a dwelling unit because there's a kitchen and a bathroom in it, even though nobody's living there, and even though it can be used as an office or some other use with a kitchen and bathroom in it. The planning board dealt with this appropriately by saying the plans have to show that this is going to be office use. And so if you look at the plans that were submitted, it is office and storage. And yes, there's a kitchen and a bathroom, but a kitchen and bathroom do not a dwelling unit make under the town's ordinance. So that, that, that just brings me back to my earlier point. The, you know, number three, that the plans be labeled that office space in building two shall only be available as personal office space for the owner. The plans were revised. They read exactly like that. Where's, I, I guess, where's the issue with going either back to the planning board, which I, I would think is the appropriate venue, to say, hey, we've met condition three. Agree that we've met condition three. And, and uh, I don't know if that is an amendment then, because you've knocked it off and you've met that condition and it's no longer a condition, but you've met it. The planning board was clear. Your client did what they were supposed to do. And for that condition, at least, it appears. And there's, a, there's an outlet for that to be resolved. I don't, I don't see this board as that outlet. And, and maybe it is in a, a second or tertiary process by which the code enforcement officer is supposed to um, you know, infer that something has been met on a planning board approval. But that's not the chain here, as far as I can see, unless I'm, and that's what I, I think, you know, I, I think Mr. Crawford, I think Mr. Kate and I, we're, we're all trying to figure out how do we get from, you know, those steps to here? Well, uh, a response from the town planner as to the sufficiency of the, of the March plans would have been helpful. We would not have filed an application for a building permit if the town planner had explained why those plans were insufficient. She did not, and the denial is based upon the January letter, which predates that submission. And that's why we're here. We cannot get an answer from anybody about why those plans don't satisfy the planning board conditions. And we're not, apparently I'm not going to get one here tonight either. And it's very frustrating for my client to go through this and to try to, to submit the things that were required by the planning board be told in the first instance that, that some plans that were submitted were not sufficient, and what did he do? He didn't appeal that. He went back and he had the plans redrawn so that they met the requirements of the planning board. And yet still, here we are, and you don't go to the planning board to determine whether a condition of approval has been met. That's not how it's done in any municipality in this area. It's the staff that makes those determinations. If you can't get the staff to make it, uh, it, it puts you into a terrible conundrum. So uh, when the January 23rd letter the, from uh, the planner, the last paragraph kind of lays out what looks to me like a roadmap of how to proceed. What was your client's reaction to that? And what's, what's your interpretation on behalf of the client as to what that paragraph means? Beginning with the planning board, we'll be holding a workshop on February 6th. Yeah. Well, you have to look back earlier in the letter, and I believe that... Um, there is a statement earlier in the letter, and I want to be exact about this. I don't want to paraphrase. OK, in the second paragraph of the first page of the letter, um, the second sentence says, I am recommending to you and the planning board 
uh, to you and to the planning board that the application return to the planning board for amendments to the original approval. And then it sets forth the things that require revision, um, which includes the submission of the floor plans and then talks about the illegal dwelling unit. But it's our position that all of those have been satisfied. But she also anyway, says there, hold on, yeah. that I suggest the, um, at that time, while not limiting the scope of the planning board review, I suggest these things. Well, I understand that the town planner said it doesn't limit it, but when we get a denial from the code enforcement officer, it is limited to the terms of the letter that we are sent. And the letter that we were sent referred to this letter. But you can't say, I'm denying it for, for these specific reasons, and then other reasons that I'm not telling you. It has to tell you what the reasons are for the denial. And so the only reasons that we have are the ones that are expressly set forth in the January yeah. 23rd letter. But I, I want to take issue with what you said, because I'm picking up again on exactly your point. This is what I asked about earlier. I mean, she concludes her letter by saying, you can come to a workshop. A workshop, I'm not sure what a workshop is, but it doesn't sound like formal approval. Right, so she's saying you can come to the planning board for amendments, but why don't you come to the workshop and work it out? And nobody did. It's not worked out at a workshop. You go to a workshop to talk to the planning board. If you want a vote of the planning board, you have to go through the full public process with notice and a hearing. And but again, your position is that it didn't need an amendment. It didn't need a full thing and it didn't need a hearing. It's just like, guys, is that's what you wanted? Yeah, that's what we wanted. Great. Exactly. Why was that not possible to do at a workshop? Uh, well, because, uh, because the planning board can't act in a workshop any more than that, you that You're not asking workshop. them to act. You weren't asking them to act. You are asking them to formally state that you've met the conditions of approval, which would require a vote, which well, would with require that to be done at a, a full Well, with that, with that discussion, presumably the planner would have been at the workshop. They would have been at the workshop. I mean, this seems to be about coming to us because <laughs> you can't get the planner, I mean, the planner to respond to her. She's not accountable to us. And it seems to me that, I mean, I mean, you're asking, you, I guess I have to say, it, it seems to me you passed up an opportunity here, and now we're dealing with it. And the opportunity was not go back to come back to the workshop and get an amendment. I mean, this letter is not written by a lawyer, it's written by a planner. It seems to me it concludes, come to the workshop and work it out, and you didn't do that. Uh, no, there was a listing of things that needed to be done. Yeah, I understand. And. Uh, and if you do the things that are required by the approval, and you do the things that are set forth in this letter from the conditions of approval of the planning board, you can't add new conditions as you go along. The planning board conditions are as set forth in the approval letter. And so to the extent that this letter refers to any of those conditions, my client went back and met those conditions by submitting those revised plans. There isn't anything else for the planning board to do here except tell their planner the conditions have been met. So my client will have lost over six months of time because instead of going back to the planning board and disputing something, he went ahead and he had the plans done up. And he submitted them in March. Now, could they have been done earlier than that? I don't know, but they were submitted in early March. So they're submitted in March and we wait until two months later with no response from the town planner, and my client applies for a building permit because there's been nothing saying, nope, you still haven't met the conditions of approval. Okay, so why didn't your client, as soon as you met, you say you met these, the, he says he met these conditions, as soon as they were met, why didn't he apply for a building permit? Well, it, first of all, you have to pull some materials together. It's okay. not just this information. You yeah. have to pull together other things to submit for the building permit. But also, uh, there was a thought that there would be some kind of response from the town okay. that either the plans are sufficient or the plans are not sufficient, yeah. and that did not happen. But your client felt he needed to go to the planner to get the approval. Uh, my client had to submit additional plans without any question. That was a condition, there was two or three conditions of approval from the planning board. So yes, that had to be done. Mm -hmm. 
I only have one follow-up question here. You talk about uh, the October 18, 2018 as an impending deadline. Why, why do you say that? Uh, because the site plan ordinance says that a site plan approval is good for one year. Right, and so the argument there is that the, the parties have to be locked in as to, it just cannot continue to go back and forth. There has to be a finality, and so that is the date, right? That is a final date from right. client, Right, so yes. on the um, October 20, 2017 letter, at the very last paragraph, there's, a, there's language in that paragraph that talks about um, issuing of the building permit as of that date of October 18. Um, so that's one part. And there's this, the following phrase that follows that is that you can ask for an extension. And there's no suggestion that it, you know, you can ask for another year um, extension, I guess, or whatever time. It doesn't help us understand why the, the deadline is so critical here, whereas that, that paragraph suggests that there's some flexibility, provided there's open communication between your client and the planning board, and arguably the town planner. My client wants to get started in this building season. It's as simple as that. If we go back to the planning board, this building season is not going to happen, um, and my client has to ask for an extension that my client doesn't feel is needed or warranted in this case. Um, again, not seeking any changes to what the planning board said to do. So why go back to the planning board? Why lose more time? So, all right, these are my last two follow-up questions. Uh, the first is, have you, notwithstanding the phone calls and, and um, conversations, have, you, have your client written and ask for a response by a date certain as to the reasons or rationale for the, um, um, why, why the conditions were not met? Well, there's no requirement that the town respond to such a thing. No, my client has not done that. Oh, okay. That's why my client submitted the building permit application. That does have <laughs> deadlines in it. That does require a response, and a response was received. The response being the uh, building application to the code enforcement officer, and then that generated the denial of the building permit. Any additional questions? Just one quick one. Uh, when did uh, your client take title to this property? You know? uh, I could not answer that right off the top of my head. I'm was sure it? Um, it's not here. Was it after the planning board approval or before? No, it was. It, my client got the planning board approval, so, okay, it was so he before. was. He was the owner before. I, I believe. Well, I should say I believe he was the owner. At the, yes, he was the owner at the time that he applied. Thank you. I should say it applied. It was an LLC, not a person. Any additional questions from the board? No. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We now have an opportunity for public comment. If anybody wants to. is up uh, in the end of February of 2019 and I was looking at this space as a potential uh, place for me to own real estate in Cape Elizabeth and move my practice there. Um, otherwise I kind of have slim pickings on commercial real estate here in Cape. Um, I was really hoping to keep my business here in Cape Elizabeth. So that's my interest but it's also kind of the timing. I, um, speaking to the owner, uh, I, the plan was breaking ground around March um, and looking ahead at my time frame, I you know, was thrilled that that was a possibility and now with delays, I'm, I'm really stuck between a rock and a hard place with trying to find a, a future home for my practice under my current lease. Um, maybe not being able to go month to month after uh, next February. So I'm here to, 
you know, uh, plead for some semblance of, you know, trying to find decisions on how to meet building code, you know, how to meet uh, and get a permit so that I can stay in Cape. So, appreciate your time. Thank you. And do we receive any public any, uh, submissions? I didn't receive any public. formal comments. I had a couple of inquiries about it, but nothing formal. Okay. So we'll open up for a board discussion. What? I'll, I'll, I'll start. start. Oh, no, please. Open for board discussion. No board discussion. Well, I, as I said, I mean, it seems to me there are several of us who are in pretty similar straits. And the, I mean, essentially, we're sort of being asked to find a question of fact, uh, with none of us having reviewed it, not having the expertise, and having no recommendations from our experts. Um, um, and as I say, from it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I gather there's been quite a bit of frustration with the city planner. I can't address that. Um, it seems to me there were workshops, I mean, I guess that were passed. Um, I, I have, I'm tempted to offer two alternative proposals. Um, one is to table it and, and, tell, and, and tell Ben to figure out what's going on. Um, another is to say, okay, we can offer our own conditional approval. Um, we could offer a conditional approval subject to Ben approving that the sub Ben has not reviewed the additional materials, as I understand, that were submitted, correct? Correct. Um, that uh, subject to Ben's satisfaction in his work with, in reviewing the additional materials for the planner, that um, he is satisfied that it's been met, then our approval would be met. Now, that puts Ben in an awkward position, both vis-a-vis -vis his colleague, planning board and in terms of his responsibility here, but um, the alternative is to say we got no place to go. So Ben, do you care to respond to any of that? Or? Uh, I, I don't think it would be appropriate for the zoning board to put me in the position of being uh, either the planner or the planning board to, to make these decisions. Ben, let me ask you a, a well, question. I guess the point to put it bluntly was maybe you can get the planner's attention and nobody else can. I don't know. It, typically, it's your responsibility to determine whether or not a project is in compliance with a site plan approval, correct? Yes. What did you say? It's so, so it is the code enforcement officers. Yes. It's, his, it's his responsibility. It's his responsibility, to, uh, in in certain cases, to uh, determine whether or not a project is in compliance with site plan, plan approvals. Yes. Once a site plan is complete, it's my job to make sure that site stays in compliance with their approval. Right. So, you know, I, I find your um, your second suggestion there. Interesting, John. Um, <laughs> but I also agree it kind of puts Ben in, a, I mean, in an awkward position. But, I mean, it's not, it's not something that's out of his normal um, purview, you know what I mean? Um, I, th I think if, I, we, if, I, we, if we really met a dead end here, you know, I, I think that's sort of, a, I think that's a desperate measure for the zoning board to take. Uh, whereas the applicant was invited to a meeting to resolve this four and a half months ago and took no action to do that. 
Uh, so I, I think to, for the zoning board to kind of go out on a limb here and put me in a pretty awkward position on it, I, I don't think it's justifiable under the circumstances. Hey Ben, I, I have a historical question because this is not the first uh, development of, of this size to come through this town. There were conditional approvals for some other developments. How, how are those conditions cleared? Were they cleared by the planner? Were they cleared by the planning board? Was there an affirmative vote? Do you have a recollection of that? They were cleared by the planner. Okay. And 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 occasionally, they, and occasionally they are asked to go back to the planning board to make minor amendments. Okay. If the planner isn't comfortable. But they don't show up to your office saying the conditions are met. Correct. Ben, you're, you're, it's also your role to determine whether or not a, pro, a proposed project requires site plan approval? Yes. I'm Do you sorry, feel... Think, isn't there an ordinance that almost all properties need a site plan now? Yeah, an, an expansion of a non-residential building yep. is one of the triggers. So I, you know, I guess the question is, you know, this is so difficult. I, I think there are much larger issues here um, with communication, and uh, I think I think we're we don't have all the facts here yeah. today because uh, because we don't have the planner and we we can't hear why she hasn't responded to the applicant. Um, but you know. I'm sorry. I move we table it. Well, well, I mean, so uh, let's talk through process, I guess. Ben, if if the applicant were to, I mean, there must be some way to get in front of the planner. I mean, even by going through the their their council member, you know, the, there must be some way to get an answer so out of the planner. Show up at a planning board meeting with the planning board and the planner and speak and. Well, I agree. Board. I mean, the the planning board issued a conditional approval, so I appreciate the 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 applicant's uh, predicament here. The planning board approves the plan with conditions and tasks the planner with determining whether or not those conditions have been met. So, it, it, you know, in my mind, it's the planning staff's job to do that. And if she's not um, responding, then I find that troubling. And, and again, I, I don't think we have all the facts here. But assuming the applicant can get in, get a meeting with the planner and or the town attorney uh, and understand where the deficiencies are and satisfy the conditions of approval, they could then return to you and you would approve a building permit, right? Yes, if the conditions become satisfied. Right. And, and I think part of the problem here is communications went from the planner and the applicants to the attorneys. And and I don't and I don't know everything that was discussed between the attorneys, subsequently. But uh, you know I know that the planner was talking to our town attorney, and the town attorney was talking to their town attorney. So it wasn't you know the planner wasn't just not not responding. I mean she she was responding through the town attorney. Okay. Um, so I don't know what she formally said to the town attorney. I don't know what the town attorney formally said to them, but. Uh, you know, there was communication going on. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, uh, back to the back to the larger picture here. I, I I don't see how we can we as a board can find that conditions of the site plan approval have been met with that, with by having a, you know a, a ten page application. Um, Full of mostly correspondence between the planner and the uh, the Can applicant. So you don't need us to approve this, right? John, you're talking to code enforcement officer. Just for the record. I'm sorry. You were speaking to the code enforcement officer, right? Right. Okay. You just said you I didn't understand you. You don't need us to approve this, do you? I mean, if, if, if she's met all of her, if they've met their requirements, it, it doesn't need to come to us, correct? This is only at us because it's an appeal, correct? Correct. Once. So once, my, yeah. my conditional approval is unnecessary. 
Yeah, and tabling it, I think, is unnecessary. What's that? I think tabling it is unnecessary, too, because yeah. I think what we want, what we'd like to see is them go <laughs> work it out with the Yeah, planet. I guess the idea would, yeah, exactly. And so the idea of tabling it would be that it's sort of without prejudice, so to speak. Um, in other words, we move to table it, go away and figure it out. Um, no, I, I think what you're saying is we don't need to table it because that would keep it. it yeah, that would keep it, it denied. Don't, the whole point is to not have it denied. Have it be set up correctly in the first place, so it never gets to us. It just goes to Ben right. as fully. Right. So, that's my point. Okay. Right. Yeah. Sorry. One reason that you yes. would not want to table it is that you allow the applicant to have a procedural mechanism to go to court. All right. So you, they have, there needs to be decision making for this, you know, to move on from this. So if, if we table it, for example, there's more limbo. Uh, that's what the applicant does not want. They want action. Yes, no. Just make a determination. They want positive action. Well, I don't think they want to go to court. <laughs> that's not going to speed this up. I mean, I don't. I'm, I mean, I'm speculating, but um, I mean, it seems to me. Well. Um, yeah, in my mind, tabling it suggests that they're going to come back to us at some time. That what? By tabling it, it to me, it suggests that they're coming back to us uh, to to provide additional information. Okay. And I don't. It, that's fine. At, at least I, I don't think that's what what we'd like to see. Uh, no, I agree with them. No. Okay. <laughs> But I mean, I, 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 this is a troubling situation. I, I, I feel for the applicant. I, but, and I don't know where it's gone off the rails. But it's, uh, I'm sympathetic, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'm also sympathetic. But regardless of the motivation behind it, it seems like it's almost like an end run around the planning process and say, you know what, we, we don't have the letter. We don't have the, what we're supposed to have. Yeah. So we're just going to go and try for a permit and go that way. Looking for a motion? Yes. Yeah, I make a motion to deny the requested appeal. Well, it's to uphold the denial, right? To deny the appeal and uphold the decision of the code enforcement officer. Second. Do you have any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Carries on opposed. Is the board going to do findings and conclusions in support of that decision? Yes. We're going to try. <laughs> so. I'm sorry? Are you looking for findings? Yes. <clears throat> so, okay, first finding would be that based upon the documentation provided to this board, there remains an outstanding zoning code violation regarding an unpermitted kitchen. No, I, I don't think we need to do that. Mm -hmm. No. No. You don't need those findings? No. So basically, uh, so we've got findings of fact here. Uh, Patrick Tinsman submitted a building permit application on May 14th, 2018. Number two, that was number one. Number two, in a letter dated May 25th, 2018, the code enforcement officer denied the application. Number three, the property received a site plan approval from the planning board on October 20th, 2017. Number four, in a letter dated January 23rd, 2018, Maureen, o Maureen O'Meara, town planner, made the applicant aware that the conditions on the site plan approval had not been met. Number five, the site plan approval states the following, 
quote, there, that, there shall, should be, that there be no issuance of a building permit nor alteration of the site until the above conditions have been satisfied and a performance guarantee has been provided to the town, close quote. And that's what we have so far. Does anybody have any additional ones they'd like to put in? Friendly amendment. I'm sorry? A friendly amendment. Yes. Uh, under the paragraph five, the site plan approval, can we just refer to the October 20th, 2017 letter? I don't think. I think that's a better way of, I agree, that's a better way of stating that. Well, actually, number five, um, sorry, can you repeat the map? So, the site plan approval um, is in caps, which is just a particular thing. Um, I don't think we're using that term referring to this letter. I would rather use the date of the letter. Um, yeah, that is, that's a condition of the site plan approval, so. Yeah, and so uh, that the letter containing the site plan approval, but this, okay. it's not just, the point being is that it's all encompassing. Um, I just want to include the date of the letter um, when we're using that phrase. But the date of the letter is just above it in, the, in, 20, in number four. So it refers, it, number four refers to the site plan approval, then that's number a five to That's a different document, I think, Aaron. Hmm. Okay. Then if that's the case, then paragraph three should say, uh, from the planning board by letter dated October 20th, 2017. So for number three, you said? Yeah. address my issue that I had number five. So on number three, I would just say after the planning board, board struck the word on, and we replaced that with by letter dated. Okay. That, Ad, another friendly amendment. I would, to number three, I would say the property received a, and I would add the word conditional site plan approval. So let me read back this proposed number three. So the property received a conditional site plan approval from the planning board by letter dated October 20th, 2017. Does that mean under number five you want to insert the word conditional in front of the site plan approval? Let me, Matt, let me reopen number three here to get some clarification. Um, if, and I, I don't remember from the documents, was the planning board meeting on t October 20th, 2017, and therefore it, the property received the site plan approval, doesn't have to reference a letter? The meeting was on the 17th, the letter was the 20th. Okay, Good. thanks. And I, I have another uh, suggestion for number five where it says the site plan approval states the following, I would say condition number nine of, if you wanna be consistent, the letter dated October 20th, or of the site plan approval, either way. So proposed number five is the site plan approval states the following in condition number nine, then open quotes. Sure. Okay. Are there any additional proposed, uh, or any propo uh, proposed additional findings of fact? Well, which, 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 which conditions are we saying we're not met? We're, we're not saying that there are specific conditions within they're, they're met. It's not our, we're saying that it's not our purview to look at the individual well, we're conditions the in the turning site. down the permit. We're the ones who get sued. We're right. We're referring to the January 23rd letter issued by the town planner, which states that the submission still does not comply. Correct. So I think for our purposes, John, the conditions haven't met in general. We, we're not looking at the specific the specifics as to why. Wasn't that the case? We just had 
remanded because we had to specify the conditions. Wasn't that just at the end of last year? I don't think we are reviewing the conditions of the site plan approval right here and, and determining whether or not those conditions have been met or have not been met, which I think is what Aaron is saying. That's what we're saying. Also, we don't want to veer into discussion again. Yeah, in the um, remanded case, those were conditions that the zoning board is specifically responsible for. Yeah. Okay, so let me actually reread number three just to get into the record. So the property received a well, condition. I just, I just remind you that the planning board approved this. With conditions. With conditions. And the planning board never said those conditions weren't met. We are. No, the plan, that's, no. The, no we're so not. The planning board, the planning the board grants they authority met. to the planning staff to determine I understand. whether or not. That goes back to my initial question at this meeting. I mean, there's no particular ordinance that says her opinion is dispositive. I mean, we are relying on her letter opinion to deny a building permit. And the planning board did not turn them down. Right. Are, so are you suggesting we, we pull individual conditions out of the site plan approval and reference them in our findings of fact? Because I, I, I'm, I'm not comfortable yeah, doing I'm that because we, 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 we don't have the We don't have the record. We don't have the documentation approval, so to we, review those conditions. We couldn't do that anyway. Yeah, it was a... Oh, it's a So number three, the property received a conditional site plan approval from the planning board by letter dated October 20, 20th, 2017. And number five, the, the conditional site plan approval states the following in condition number nine, and then the quotes that's already written down there. As a pedantic point, mm -hmm. so the approval, conditional approval was given at the meeting and that was then reflected in a letter. So in theory, I'm not sure if it's recorded, so that you know the, the best evidence or the most accurate evidence of what the approval was is happened on the 17th. Mm -hmm. uh, and then now we're reflecting as to um, the planning board's authority to set out the, what the conditions are in the, in the letter of the 20th. Query whether we should include a line item for the meeting on the 17th as well as a letter on the 20th. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's necessary. I mean, I. I, I don't think there's. Do wonder if number number five is actually redundant in its entirety, because we're referencing effectively um, that in number three anyway. Well, I I I, I like number five because it you know, specifically says no issuance of a building permit until the above conditions have been satisfied. And yeah. I'm, I know it, it, I'm not a lot of this there is, on that, so. I know a lot of this is no, kind I, of restating I agree with the, the obvious. Specificity in there, yeah, actually, yeah. Is, is a good, uh, good. So, do we have a motion to approve the findings of fact as proposed? As amended. As amended? Yes. So moved. Second. Or, I, John, I read them off the, 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 as read. Findings of fact. Fine. So you were seconding the motion? No. Okay. Um, just <laughs> point of order. So on the number one, okay. uh, sorry, number two, the letter dated May 25th, denied the application. Do you want to add, a, add some rationale as to why that's the case? And that's it. The letter it really um, speaks for itself on that. Yeah, yeah. We're not stapling the code enforcement's letter to this uh, findings of fact, but query whether we say, you know, for on the basis of 
um, you know. No, I, I, th I think it goes on to in number four saying that there are these conditions and that there were conditions and the, the approval, I'm sorry, that the conditions had not been met. And then number five gives the language in that approval that sets up the permit not being, that they should not be issued. You know, I don't think, I don't believe we need to encompass all of that into okay. number three. I think th it looks clear to me, then, but I'm. Okay. So right now we have a, we have a motion to accept those findings of fact. No, uh, second. Do we have a second? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All in favor. So it passes. Sorry, I missed that voting. I thought we already voted, but apparently not. What was the vote? Can you restate? It, it was fi uh, to accept the findings of fact yes. as amended. Okay. And it passed five to one. Okay. Okay. With one abstention. With right. Mr. Crawford abstain. Uh, no, I'm not voting for it. Okay. Not in He's voting against. They're voting against. Okay. Okay. Includes that matter. Right. No further uh, business to move to adjourn. Do you want to go over the exes in the last, the last meeting's minutes? Who did the motions? Uh, I think Ben is going to provide yeah, those. Yeah. We're going to review them yeah, at the next the meeting. Video and everything. Yeah, yeah I've, I've got all. I've got that documented. Yeah. Okay. So, we're, we're, do we need to move to adjourn? Yes. Uh, move to adjourn. We're adjourned. Mr. Chair, I could just ask one question. Sure. We need an opportunity to talk anyway. Maybe if uh, Ben could talk to uh, Maureen, if we can get a uh, meeting scheduled.